In the second set of experiments, we were able to go to Morea. This is uh, the island uh, next to Tahiti. This is in Cook's Bay, so it was visited by Captain Cook. Here we are, excuse me, I misspoke. It's September 1987. And just think about this extraordinary, beautiful scenery. As a graduate student, um, it was amazing. And again, this is the kind of opportunity when you embark on field studies, become a scientist, you get to go to all corners of the world. And really, it was one of the things that attracted me to science in the first place was the fact that you get to travel and go to these really beautiful places. Here's another scene of the beautiful volcanic islands around Morea, a tropical paradise. There's actually a school that has a station, a field station here on Morea. And again, because we couldn't do radioactive experiments on board Calypso, on this particular set of trips, we hired this fishing vessel. And they were a little, they allowed us to use radioactive isotopes on board ship. Now let me let me be clear, the radioactivity that we're using, the C-14, isn't dangerous. It's not the kind of thing that is going to create a nuclear bomb and it's not going to make you your face melt or anything like that. Um, but it is something about which you need to be careful and you can't throw it around the ship. But so opposed to nuclear weapons was Calypso and Jacques Cousteau that it was appropriate that he kept radioactive materials off of his ship in that carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope, is a byproduct of that kind of research. So instead, we use this, this boat, this fishing boat, to do the C-14 experiments. We got up before dawn, as you can see here. Off, this is off the coast of Tahiti, taking water samples. This is Dale Robinson. He is, uh, I believe, up in the Bay Area, Bay Area currently as an oceanographer. Um, Dick Murphy, um, taking water samples before dawn and those water samples are then put into separate bottles. Here's Mr. Tahiti again. You get some idea of the way the native Tahitians dress. And the idea here was then to incubate different, different water samples uh, using C14. So the water samples were then taken from Calypso onto the fishing boat where we inoculated them with C14. And then those samples were put out at different depths and also for different periods of time. We actually took measurements, two-hour measurements, through the period of the day, and also did a set of measurements where we measured C14 uptake throughout the entire period of the day. Again, trying to measure rates of carbon fixation, rates of photosynthesis using C14. At this, and here we have uh, an example of the kinds of bottles that we use, these clear polycarbonate bottles here, uh, Dale Robinson and Dick Murphy are pulling those bottles up. At the same time, the crew of the Calypso um, is making continuous measurements of natural fluorescence in the water column. So even though we're not measuring the natural fluorescence of the samples themselves, which is perhaps some cause for a little bit of concern or there's assumptions being made in it, but we're getting some idea, some estimate again of the amount of productivity using uh, carbon-14 and the amount of productivity using natural fluorescence by making these comparisons. And here you can see what is a very atypical uh, ship's crew in America. The French, or at least aboard Calypso, uh, had no qualms about being barefoot. All these guys are avid scuba divers. They've probably logged more scuba time than, any, than most people in that they are always were filming underwater documentaries. And so uh, if something went overboard or you had a problem, these guys would jump over and take care of it right away. Um, much, very um, convivial crew, very lively and energetic and fun to work around. Um, but they had a much different sort of approach to working on a ship than you might find on an American vessel where everybody would be in steel-toed shoes and hard hats and all those other kinds of things. Here we also measured uh, natural fluorescence continuously. There's a computer inside one of these boxes and here's a little hockey puck again and over the side is a spectroradiometer that's measuring fluorescence continuously in the bay. So while we had our other experiments out measuring C14, we also had the profiles that were being done by the ship's crew as well as an instrument for measuring C14, uh, excuse me, natural fluorescence continuously in Cook's Bay. Well, at the end of trips aboard Calypso, and at, at the end of the first trip in particular, they always have big celebrations. And this is the scene that greeted us off the coast of 
New Zealand. And when I say don't ask me about the end of exhibition champagne party, uh, I say that somewhat amusingly. Uh, they brought out boxes of champagne from the ship's hold and it was a, a successful party, not a successful next day. However, when we did get to Auckland, I finally got to meet Jacques Cousteau. Uh, this is where we met him in, uh, in Auckland, New Zealand. And here's the man himself. This was the first time I'd le ever laid eyes on my boyhood hero. And truly, everything I've learned about the man and everything I know about the man and every conversation that I had with him he is a magnanimous person and deserves that title of hero. Um, everything I felt about him and thought about him um, really was confirmed upon meeting him. You know, sometimes you meet your heroes and they turn out to be less than what you thought originally. This man is truly a magnificent man and a hero to us in many different ways. His many, many different accomplishments, not only just uh, in ocean education, but also his political accomplishments are legendary. And here you can see that when he came, to New Zealand. He was met by a huge press corps. He gave a press conference um, talking about the work that he was going to do in New Zealand. And if you ask me again, I'll tell you some interesting stories about having uh, dinner with um, Commander Cousteau uh, aboard um, for the couple nights that we got to stay in New Zealand. And if you also ask me too, I'll, I'll send you a link for uh, a welcoming ceremony that was part of this. But he talked about the expedition and what they were doing afterwards, and it was an extraordinary experience to be part of. Here is Rocky Booth, who developed the spectro radiometer that I just talked about, but I, and, and I want to give him some props for also being a part of these experiments that were uh, a major part of my PhD and my awarding of my doctorate, but I also want to introduce Madame Cousteau, Simone Cousteau, who also traveled with the ship, and she was sort of the ship's caretaker, the ship's nurse, um, the person that people went to when they needed to talk about something. Just a really wonderful woman on board ship as well. And she had a dog named Uki. Now, poor little Uki, which means snow in Japanese, he didn't take to the sea life very well. And apparently sometime after we left the ship, Uki had to go out in the middle of a storm and take a leak. And, well, Uki didn't make it. I don't know why they didn't put a rope around his neck or something to be safe, but that was the last they saw of Uki. And before they realized Uki was gone, well, it was too late to try to go back and find him. And it's kind of an upsetting story, but if that does upset you, you can just imagine that Uki became a dogfish, and he's still swimming the ocean to this day. Poor little Uki. Well, life aboard ship involved more than just doing oceanographic research. Here you see uh, their peeling potatoes. Here you also see what they call the French bathing suit. And uh, most of the Frenchmen, most of the time, wore these kinds of bathing suits, um, even though you see them in the swim trunks here. Uh, more European style than what you would find here in the US. But the food aboard ship was extraordinary. In fact, in one of the worst storms that I, we've ever encountered, and watching this cook as plates and pans and pots were being shoved back and forth and he's screaming in French and trying to cook his soup and trying to make homemade potato chips. He produced this most extraordinary meal and meals aboard Calypso were really something to behold. Um, every meal was accompanied by soup, started out with soup and we had wine with our soup and we had like a second course and third course and a dessert, really fabulous food on board ship and really quite a life and quite an experience. Of course, there was always work to be done. We didn't have to do any scrubbing of the decks because we were the scientists. However, um, the crew were always busy doing various kinds of work, but occasionally there was time for fun. And one of the other Tahitian natives that worked aboard the ship would bring out his guitar from time to time and sing songs to us. And there's nothing like the experience of being at sea. There's nothing like the experience of working so closely with other people on a ship for a week or two weeks, in this case three weeks, um, and just being part of a world, your own little world, and leaving the rest of the world behind.